If we don't do what we love, then we wouldn't exist. It's time, kid. I just have to say, I think there's a lot of women at this point that are trying to audition to me, Mrs. Jordan. Is like, that we'll what just, it is? yeah, but this is the first time you're playing a dad, and I think like that is it harder than the boxing, or was that like the easier part? Like, what was it playing having dad? the kid on set? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've um, no, I loved it. You know, I've, I've um, you know, I can't wait to be a father. You know, when the right time, you know, comes for that, and to be able to imagine and make believe that I had a daughter and, you know, and, and have that family was, uh, was, uh, it was really satisfying for me. Another great aspect of the film, I love you and Tessa, like y'all's dynamic is just absolutely amazing and it really shows black love. But I'd have to say your chemistry with Sly is like my favorite and yeah. I'm hoping that he maybe let some Rocky Three, Rocky Four nuggets go this time. Like you've been kind of tight lipped. Tell me something they told you from bringing it like from back then that you were surprised about or what's he like that you people mean, be surprised about? You mean like him, you mean like Rocky or Sly? Uh, like from the filming of the first couple films, like uh, did he bring anything back being like, this is just like what we did or is there something about him maybe offset that people be surprised about? Sly is a prankster. Yeah, Sly is very mischievous. So he, he, he definitely finds ways to, to stir, stir the pot a little bit on set. Um, you know, he, he's always got a million stories to tell because he's lived so much life and he's been through so much. So to be able to kind of like tell stories or, you know, um, I don't know, like change the labels on things around set. He's just, he's just a very mischie mischievous guy. So it's, it's always fun with him on set. I would have been so surprised about that one. Um, I love the film. I'll just go ahead and say it. It was like so much fun, but the training montage. Yes. So how did y'all approach this one? You know, it's very different from the first film, and I think very different from all the other ones. How did y'all approach making this one feel unique? Uh, just trying to see something that hasn't been done before. Uh, we haven't we haven't really seen that desert montage before. So, uh, me and Steven, you know, and and Sly also trying to find places uh, to give some grit, but also make sense in the story. Uh, we wanted to, you know, challenge physically what. The one of the biggest things about these montages is what is he learning outside of the ring that he's going to take with him inside the ring that's going to overcome the challenge and and we wanted you know the pain obviously he needed to be able to take it the punishment that he was obviously going to get um, and it was about endurance it's like how how much can you actually endure so you know we took Adonis through hell you know we we took him to the to the breaking point. Love that, and it was yeah. We felt it. Trust me. Uh, another one, I think, when I look back to going back to Fruitvale, like mm -hmm. Ryan's not on this one, but his DNA is all throughout the film. And I look at y'all's partnership together. You guys have come to such great heights together. Mm -hmm. What do you think if you go back from Fruitvale to now would be the biggest battle that you fought with him? No, oh, in general, just okay. in general. And then what's been the sweetest victory? Like going back through these three films that kind of like I think have brought y'all to this point. Another great question. Um, I think each movie is a battle. Um, so many things has, has to happen right in order for a movie to get made. I think maybe... You said the greatest battle that we won for. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make it all in one. I'm just gonna put it all in one. I think it was it was it was um it was tough to to, sorry, I got you. Uh, <laughs> it was tough to figure out Black Panther. Um, a lot of people don't realize I was on a contract with, you know, with, with, with Fox for Fantastic Four, so technically I wasn't supposed to be playing in Marvel's world, you know, um, to play that character because they still had an option on me. So to be able to kind of like make that work between studios, um, thank God to Emma Watts and Jim Giannopoulos and Kevin Feige and everybody that kind of got on the same page and allowed that to happen. But there was a lot of mountains that needed to be moved in order for me to play Killmonger. And um, it was a collective battle and then we all kind of, we kind of, it, it made it happen. It worked out. It's like nothing really matters to him right now, including me. You gotta think real hard about this. Do you got people that need you now? I'm taking the fight. So 
you were voted on our list of fearless female heroines, which we admire, number four with Valkyrie. Oh my God. Yeah, can we just talk about that? Kudos to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Run down the list. Yeah. I want all the other, how, how so many So actually, there? no, you're number three. So it was um, Working Girl, uh, Tess McGill was number yeah, two. Awesome. And then number one was Ellen Ripley. Wow! Yeah, and then Valkyrie. Really? Yeah. So kudos to that. But I That's think so cool. I think it's a, a theme with you to like have these great, strong, also vulnerable, intensely feminine, like admirable women in your like cast of characters that you've played. They're always that way. I feel like that. Going back to dear white people, and Thanks. even going back to Grace. I mean, let's talk oh, about yeah. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what do you feel about Bianca? How does she show her strength? Because I feel it's a different type of strength that we don't always see. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you said the word strong and then you said all sorts of other adjectives. Um, to me, strong just means that the character is finely drawn, that that she isn't painted in broad strokes. Um, and I, I really like sort of um, trying to buck convention. And also, I think the truth is we are not confined by the things that make us up in terms of gender or race or any of those things. Um, so I don't know. I I, I, I I love to play people that are multifaceted because that's kind of all I know how to do because that's what we are, you yeah. know, and to be able to bring my own humanity to, to parts. But that's thank you so much for acknowledging that at Rotten Tomatoes. That's no, very cool. definitely. Like and Valkyrie. then also on this one, we have to acknowledge your songwriting skills made another appearance. Yeah. If people don't know you did perform in the first one, but also wrote in the first mm -hmm. one and then back at it again. Talk about adding these collaborators and how, you know, we just added more, I think, to the tapestry of Bianca this time around. Yeah, well, you know, we obviously these characters have evolved in the in the space of whatever, three years since the since you last saw them on screen. And so it's, it was important for Bianca's music to also evolve that a you know a reflection of her maturity happens inside of what's happening with the music sonically, and we also wanted to play with this idea that maybe she's um, you know invited a pop sensibility that she is this artist that is transitioning from being this indie artist that just makes music in her living room alone to being an artist that wants to to reach. Um, you know, more people and how you do that. And so we had folks like James Fauntleroy come in, which was incredible and right. Um, and Bibi Borelli came in and we wrote a song together. Uh, she's an incredible independent artist, but also writes for the likes of Rihanna. And that was so cool. I mean, to get to work in the company of the, these people really are just geniuses. They're, they're so savanty. And uh, I just, it was so nice to be in, in their presence and to also have them, you know, sort of help Bianca's voice grow and expand. And it's so great. I love the last song. And that's all I'll say about that. No spoilers. But also the greatest, I think, part of this movie is how great it shows black love. Like, yeah. that scene in the first one where Adonis is doing your hair. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just like relationship goals <laughs> and it's not sexual yeah so talk about in this movie what's that non-sexual like emblemation of their like relationship that you really liked oh like I love this scene when they're in bed together sort of um cuddling and he's on her stomach and I, I, to me the thing that's so beautiful about their love is they can speak so candidly to each other and they keep each other honest that inside of a very romantic love which they have is also just a platonic love that comes from real true companionship and I feel like that's something that is like enduring and, and really awesome and like not the steamiest so you don't always see it projected in Hollywood and especially um, when we talk about representation I don't feel like we see that often enough with um, black folks mm -hmm. on film or we see it in a way that feels specific to us and we have a movie that feels for us by us like Love Jones but it, it's uh, it you know it gets boxed into a space of being insular or being like a black movie. And the truth is, it's just a good movie about humans um, who happen to be black. And I, I love that. I love that sort of like normalizing of our love, that our love is universal. It looks like everyone else's love, but inside it, there's also specificity that has to do with undoing braids and cocoa butter and silk wraps on hair and all of that that we know and understand so that when we go to the cinema, we, we look at the images projected and we go, oh, I know that. Like, I've seen that. Like, that sort of recognition, I think, is deeply powerful. And particularly if you're not accustomed to having it nearly enough and also in the context of big movies like this. So um, it's not lost on me how significant it is. 
Victor Drago, son of Ivan Drago, who infamously killed Apollo Creed, appeared today to issue a challenge to Adonis Creed. Don't do this. I ain't got a choice. That's the same thing your father said, and he died right here in my hands. First of all, let me just say the film was so much fun. It was great. And I think the best part that's going to surprise people is y'all's dynamic. Like, the father, son, like, yeah. I, I, I was believing every minute of it. So tell me, was there any <laughs> behind the scenes stuff that y'all used to kind of get that father son dynamic to feel so real on screen? Yeah. Well, you start for a change. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, um, you know, we really tried to create a father son relationship in and also side of the of the ring and you know Dolph initiated it a lot like he was asking me uh, out to to work out together to having dinner together to do rehearsals together because he really wanted to be authentic while doing this father son thing I think we created a pretty strong bond and we like each other in real life too I think you can tell that on screen and yeah being authentic I think so yeah we we had to do our our incredibly exhausting uh, Russian lessons together, yeah. uh, and uh, I kind of, you didn't want to do it, I pushed you into it many times, exactly. because I knew that it was going to pay off one day. Yep, and it paid off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. you didn't get to speak as much Russian in the first one. This one, you guys are going at it like the I whole know. time. Yeah. Uh, which was harder, the Russian or the boxing? Uh, the yeah. Russian. The Russian, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I, so, yeah. I mean, boxing, you know, it's like, yeah. it's also, it was exhausting, make, make no mistake about that. But the Russian stuff being, because we wanted, you know, Dolph is the uh, same as me. We, if we do something, we want to do it as perfect as possible. And this language is a real tongue breaker. Like, mm. the, to get the right pronunciation on every single word, it was tough. And we were rehearsing with our dialect coach so many times. Yeah. Like you said, he kept pushing me because I was like, I, <laughs> <laughs> and she was so scared of me towards the end because she'd have to tell the director that it wasn't correct in my long speech. And I'd say, what? <laughs> Who said that? And I'd, come on. It's like, it's two in the morning. She'd go, no, but it didn't sound right. I was like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Poor lady, yeah, but it, it it shows on screen because I don't know Russian, but it sounded it sounded great to me. Um, as I was telling you, uh, Florian, I'm I'm obsessed with your Instagram because yeah. it's just it's insane. Like you don't you look not human. It's not fair. <laughs> I really <laughs> think. Um, but was there a rivalry with Mike from that? Because I have a feeling you guys you got like to competing for the yeah. Man of the year I mean, <laughs> that's let's talk about it. <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> You know, Mike became a very close brother, a very close friend uh, of mine. Same for Steven, because, you know, we're kind of the new generation here. Mike is uh, 31, Steven 30, I'm 28. And, you know, what I appreciated about Mike a lot was that he was very supportive. So he, he tried to help me wherever he could. It was the same as Dolph. So, like, in total working with this cast together was so easy. No egos walking around on set. Everyone tried to support each other and it was like a family. That's, I think you can tell that on screen. That's why the movie is getting so good along. Cause mm -hmm. we're no, like you, a big family. You can tell it on screen. Like I said, especially um, with you guys. And Dolph, I know you've been acting for a long time and I uh, forgive me for saying it, but I think we're in the middle of a Dolph naissance. I mean, with <laughs> the Creed like and that. with- you still with, Yeah, you totally can. With Arrow and with Aquaman coming mm -hmm. out soon. I mean, what do you feel it's like taking this new sort of like resurgence in your career and, and, and doing it still going back to a character you played like 20 years ago? <sighs> Uh, sorry, but 33 years ago. Oh, uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> no, 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 thank you very much. Well, it's, it's a great feeling, and uh, I worked hard for it, but I think it just time had to be right. I couldn't have done it 10 years ago. I don't think I was ready, and I don't think you have to... You have to reach a certain age for, I think, to, that, to be able to play a father and play more mature characters. And, uh, you know, um, it feels great, and this film certainly... Uh, because it's Drago and because it's a Rocky thing, it will it will be a big part of that resurgence. So Dolph Surgeons, whatever you call it. <laughs> Dolph Naissance. Dolph Naissance. Yeah, wow, we're getting that's the, that's complicated. We're getting we're getting the like Dolph renaissance of Dolph. Dolph, yeah. Dolph Naissance, okay. Yeah, I like that Thank you. I like that too. <laughs> round after round. You learn more about yourself. And when I stepped in that ring. 
It wasn't all about me. Like, Tessa, you hear that? We getting compliments on the hair. <laughs> yeah. The head wrap thing. Uh, no, the head wrap, the, that That's was me. definitely key. Um, we did talk about the scarf and cocoa butter, so like... The did, cocoa we, butter? Yeah, oh, did. man. I love it. <laughs> but back to the movie, man. I, no. I have to talk about, you know, I guess the, the person who wasn't here, but he was a shadow over the whole thing, and that's yeah. B. Ryan. So you yeah, both yeah, went to USC, cool. mm -hmm. both, you know, won ABFF shorts. Tell me about how he approached you, and he's a mm -hmm. producer on this, so just talk about y'all's relationship oh, no, and I, then cover I, the project. No, I haven't told a story yet, but uh, ironically enough, we were talking like a week before I got the call from MGM, was not about Creed, it wasn't about anything. Ah, I can't remember what I was asking, I was asking about something personal, um, dealing with the career, and he gave me some advice on something. So it had nothing to do with the movie whatsoever. And then a week later, the studio called, and they were like, you know, hey, we want you to direct Creed too. And I was like, off of what? Y'all haven't even met me yet. And then uh, they saw the first feature of the land, and then it was like, Coog spoke highly of you, and Sly saw the land actually too, and responded to it. And so I was like, man, I was like, all right, let me meet with these guys. And um, he was super supportive, obviously. Uh, he uh, we went to school together. We have similar tastes in a lot of things. We're all the same age, me, him, Mike, Tess, everybody. So we just, you know, kind of just clicked, Is that, if I'm allowed to say that. We just were like, oh, let's make it happen. No. Um, so it was easy to say yes in that regard. The challenge obviously was like, it's a sequel and you guys killed the first one. Like, how do we make it better? And do you guys want to make it better? Are y'all here to make it better? Um, and they were, you know, it just wasn't like a money grab or anything. These guys were like, how do we grow as characters? And that's where we, you know, added the depth. Yeah, I think it really shows, and the scene I think it shows in the most, and uh, forgive me, Ryan, I love his sequences, but the training, training montage, montage scene, yeah. that is just something out of this world, because every Rocky movie has a training montage. It's like mm -hmm. a huge part of the DNA. Yeah. So talk about putting your stamp on that and how like it went yeah. from concept to the screen. No, for sure. Um, at first, uh, Sly, Sly was very adamant about doing something different, which is awesome. Um, but he, he, he was like, dude, wouldn't it be cool, because I was in the snow, they would be in the heat. And I was like, cool. So he had the idea of putting it in the desert. Um, it's supposed to be Death Valley in California. And then everything else, as far as the workouts, I just started looking up multiple workouts and then I knew Sly's format in, um, in uh, the montages. They did the same thing in Creed where you start off and go high and then boom, the score kicks in and you go crazy. And so I knew the format, but I was really looking into like new workouts people haven't seen and then workouts that made sense in the fight later, how to endure pain, hitting in the abs, a place where he got hit mm -hmm. earlier and the ribs and all that jazz. And then the vomiting felt real. Um, Cause I remember I saw Florian working out one time and he started throwing up. And I was like, dang, he's working out that. He's just a monster if you haven't seen him. Yes. And so that wasn't even it. I was like, I'm taking that. I'm using that in the script. We're gonna go vomit in the desert. <laughs> um, so all those moments and then the car, you know, obviously him sprinting, uh, the car being symbolic for Apollo Creed, being, you know, present because his dad gave him that car and it's a carryover from Creed 1, so it meant something. And so just try to give you bits of what you like from what Ryan did in Creed 1, but yet then try to put my own little thing to it. Yeah, also another thing that they did that, the movie does it great, but the score, like Ludwig, I think, like just totally just He's put... Nice just yes. put so much on it. So talk about how working, scoring that, because again, another huge part about mm -hmm. Rocky is the music. So how did y'all approach yeah. making it feel different, but the same? I'll, I'll talk specifically in that moment, just because that took a lot of work, you know, so Ludwig, his process is just like, just keep throwing stuff at me, you know, and he's like, you know, let's find something that works. And then Mike Will was also in the mix. So like, this is the first time that kind of collaboration had happened. So between Mike Will, I, and him, we were all trying to find artists. And then uh, Interscope got me hip to Jacob Banks. And I was like, dude, because I, I was starting off the montage with uh, Nina Simone at first. Oh, wow. And it was uh, a Strange Fruit. And the studio was like, you can't have Strange Fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I get it. I was like, it's just for a tone vibe until we get the vibe. And then I talked mm -hmm. to Jacob Banks. And Jacob Banks was like, you want this kind of deep rooted. And I was like, at the top of it, I want people to feel the grit, mm -hmm. uh, like a Nina Simone type vibe. He's like, this is the closest I can get with my voice. And he kind of led the way. And so we used his vocals as a template. And then Mike Will does the beats. And yeah. then uh, Ludwig does the whole entire score. And then ASAP came in. Oh my God, just Sorry. like have a like like a rock like jam session with everybody. Oh yeah, just oh completely. About, oh, and like... by the way, the best part about it, as we're creating this, Childish was in the studio with us during the session. The kid you not, it was his birthday. A shout out to Childish. It was my first time meeting him. So as we're as we do this whole thing, he came by with his fam and can it was I just cool. have your life for a huh? day. <laughs> can I have your life for a you day? Can have it. You can have it. <laughs> This here is all about my wife, my kids, the life that I live through the night. 
I was his, it was right what I did My ups and downs, my slips, my falls My trials and tribulations, my heart, my balls This won't be the end of me Or you It can't be, cause we're a team Now you know what you're fighting for